I remember my history teacher in school saying, you know, to understand your future, Ajit, you need to understand the past. And I didn't understand him at the time. Um, but with slowly developing maturity, I see the wisdom in his words. And this is not a news story. And most of us can remember in high school going through kind of the history of, um, you know, genetics. And I'm not going to bore you with the things, the things that you already know. Um, but I'm going to talk about Huntington's. So in 1983, they found the genetic basis of Huntington's, the gene variant, the protein. But did it lead to better therapeutics? Uh, no, not so far that I'm aware of. Did it lead to assistance in guiding families on their risk and dilemmas of getting screening? Yeah, probably. Um, did it make a big public health impact? No. So I think a lot of people will look at that as an exemplar of, well, genetics, so what? Um, but I don't think the story ends in 1983. Um, 1985 was a key year. Um, so the multiple Nobel laureates in this historic list, PCR enabled amplification of a DNA sample. That enabled um, a lot of labs to develop tests. Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH, uh, so he's Insel's boss, um, a a along with other groups, um, found the uh, uh, um, cystic fibrosis gene variant. This has now led to new therapeutics, including genetically guided therapeutics. So it's interesting that some things don't lead to outcomes straight away. Others, a few years later, are actually changing what we do about conditions. And life expectancy now for cystic fibrosis, for some individuals, is expected to parallel the, the normal population. Question? Yeah, I agree. I think the, the most powerful technologies are the low-tech ones, like what's happening in this room right now, a network of people thinking, sharing ideas. Um, so I agree. I think, in, in fact, the, the psychosocial is the most powerful part of science. Serendipity, people talking, thinking out of the box a bit, not too much, talking to others, getting reality feedback. So I, I agree. And, and these factors could actually be relevant. Things have accelerated, so I'm not going to bore you with lots of slides um, like this, but the Human Genome Project was started in 1990, um, and since then, the, in the US, they estimate for every dollar they spent on it, the US economy's got $180 back. So there's something about, there's limitations to the cultural foundations of the US, but there's something about what they do that does stuff. So they've, they, they, they've had already lots of yield from that, and we're not even seeing the upswing in potential applications. Funnily enough, 93, a few years later, that's when people figured out ultra-rapid metabolizers at cytochrome P452D6. So most people are sort of familiar with P450 enzymes that are heavily expressed in the liver and are key enzymes that chew away antidepressants. So when you swallow an antidepressant or a psychotropic, most of it uh, doesn't get past the liver. So I tell my patients the liver is the gatekeeper to the bloodstream. It detoxifies what we eat. And so what they found in 93 is that some people have different types of metabolism based on genetics. Could this affect dosing, serum levels, etc.? So 1993 was sort of the beginning in some ways of modern pharmacogenetics. The Human Genome Project took a while to finish. It's interesting, 2003 it finished, 2003 CASPI came out with their seminal paper, which most people should be aware of, and I'll show some slides later. And um, the beautiful thing of the CASPI paper, which I'll try and illuminate more, is the interplay between environment and genetics. And now we have a biological pathway that explains the interconnection. It's called epigenetics, um, which is really how environmental uh, stressors, events can alter gene expression which is kind of cool. And the way I explain it to people is it's almost like the human brain's, brain's got different settings. It's got a setting for secure attachments. It's got a setting for disorganized attachments. And it figure out how quickly you should breed and behave depending on which setting the brain's switched to. I can't prove this. This is one of my crazy ideas. But it seems to make sense. And people sort of understand that. And it helps us to explain also why childhood trauma 
is no small or irrelevant thing. It's really important. Um, but even, even a bigger thing, I think, is, is emotional neglect of children. Um, you know, and them not feeling securely connected to anybody. That can change your brain beyond neuroplasticity. Um, it can change actually how your genes are expressed. And also, as we know from telomere work, it can frazzle the ends of your DNA too much stress as well. So I'm glad that we've got a biological area that doesn't invalidate what we know as clinicians is the elephant in the room. Psychosocial stressors now, and in particular, traumatic stressors in childhood. Happy, I was very happy. Often I'd look in biological things and they seem to be disconnected from clinical reality. So it's interesting serendipitously that same year, 03, CASPI and Human Genome finished. 2008, the International Thousand Genomes Project was done. So they could only afford to do a thousand genomes back then because it cost too much. This year, in the State of the Union address of Obama, he's announced gen uh, genotyping one million Americans. Last year, uh, in the UK, they announced genotyping 100,000 Brits, and they've just started doing that last month. The reason it's scaled up is the price point has dropped. So now we can actually get data. So I think one of the bottlenecks to getting empirical evidence base as to is this good or is it snake oil, was it cost a heck of a lot. And if you've ever applied for research funding, you realise that you have to be a multi-Nobel laureate to be a shoe in and there's not many around. Um, so now what's happening is because it's cheap, uh, there's going to be a lot more research, which is good, uh, to answer clinical questions. What's happened to the 23 and me data? They own that and they're going to set up their own pharmaceutical company based on it. Um, you said there were 900,000 people mm, that yeah. tested. What's, what's happened to all that? Yeah, that's proprietary. So they're proprietary data they own and they're going to set up their own pharmaceutical company. They were going to sell it to other pharmaceutical companies, but because they've got spare money from Google, like a bill here and a bill there, um, they're going to set up their own now. So it's very interesting times. And that's also disruptive change. You know, this, that's disruptive change. We'll see how it pans out, whether it's change for good or bad or somewhere in between as it often is. Mm -hmm.